It's the world's best shows from Las Vegas, and it's very rare you're in the presence of a star, but we are today. John O'Hurley is a man who's been around for many, many years, and he's now in Spamalot in Las Vegas. How are you? Well, I'm phenomenal. Thank you for asking. I was <laughs> That's, um, no, I'm having the time of my life here. This is uh, probably one of the great shows that I've ever been it, uh, involved in in my entire career so it's uh, you're catching me at a singular moment the, the character that I played on Seinfeld Jay Peterman really is uh, King Arthur really is an extension of him the only thing that separates the two of them is about 700 years and a set of coconuts <laughs> Talk to us about the show itself. I mean, it's Monty Python. I'm not a fan of it, to be honest with you. And I know that sounds odd coming from a Brit. It's more vaudeville shtick than it is Monty Python, isn't it, really? It really is vaudevillian shtick. And it, uh, and, and it, there, there's also a dryness to it um, that... Uh, um, uh, but with a sense of the nobility of purpose. This, sh this show is funny only if you take the nobility of their purpose in searching for the grail and organizing the knights of the round table. You have, to you have to really subscribe to the nobility of what they're doing in order for it to be funny. Because then if you, if you, if you set that up as the standard, then you can go off in any direction and parody it. And that's what we do in this, so that it makes it surreal and you, you, you're, on a, you're on a boat with no keel, basically. <laughs> I think you're perfectly cast for this for two reasons. One, you're very tall. And secondly, you have a great deep voice, which you kind of need for the authority of the role. You're playing King Arthur. So you've got to be almost royal, haven't you? And also that I also can take my voice and send it way up into the stratosphere when he's totally disillusioned, which is a very British <laughs> tactic. Too. One of the things I've learned that basically when the Brits communicate their emotions with their, the musicality of their voice. Exactly, whereas the Italians do it with their hands. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the reaction you get to this show here in Vegas. It's a shorter show for a start. This is such a ridiculous show. It doesn't matter how short it is because each section is funny in its own. There's not really a story, although there is. Do you take my point? Yes, I do, and, and that's very observant of you. It's basically skit humor that's strung together with the thinnest of plots. But what, and that, is, that sounds like a toilet behind you that was flush <laughs> if you are listening to this and wonder what that sound was. That's a huge toilet that was just flushed. Um, the, uh, um, it, it has the thinnest of plots, yes. And it, so it is skit humor. And it, uh, but that's the beauty of it. And the difference between um, this and most other Broadway shows, the success in Vegas is because we have a different audience out here. We have people that aren't trying to grow. They're not trying to learn. They're coming to escape for a weekend or for a convention. They want to see a brand. They want to see a spectacle. And they want to see the best that they can see. Um, we've been named the number one show in Vegas. Um, we have a very good brand in Monty Python, and I think certainly the most talented cast that's ever been assembled for Spamalot anywhere in the productions that they have, and then the producers do agree with us. <laughs> Let's talk about the audience and their reaction to it. I mean, I was surprised how loud the audience were the first time I saw it on Broadway. I didn't know whether they get it, because the humor is very silly at times. Well, I also, yes, but I also think silly humor is the most intelligent humor, because it allows you to make, you actually can perceive people making fun of themselves and people who can make fun of themselves are I think the most intelligent and relaxed human beings and wonderful to be around it's the people that are so brittle around the edges that they can't take poke fun at themselves that I don't particularly want to be in around and I hope they don't come to the show because they won't get it John tell me about what it's like to be funny every night when you're feeling crappy and you've had a hard day and you've been fighting the traffic and you've not had any dinner and then you've got to fly out somewhere straight after the show is it tricky being funny regardless of how good the material is no, it's actually a wonderful full escape. Uh, I love entertaining people, and I love hearing laughter. And I also know, because I also think of timing as kind of very percussive. It's a beat. I hear a beat in my head. And when I hit that beat correctly, it's a very, very addictive thing, much the same way a drummer or a jazz musician would riff uh, on, a, on, a, on a saxophone or something like that. When you hit that riff correctly, you know it's like, wow, that was great. And, and I get the same satisfaction delivering a line correctly. And I never, uh, but I never set anything. I, I make one promise to myself before I go out on stage every night. Is I will learn something new about the show tonight. So I always stay open. And I always try to surprise myself with something new. And, ev and every night I find something different that I do. I mean, last night I did something different on stage, and I went, I've got to keep that in the show. That was great. And it, 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 so the, the, the role is a really a collection of great moments. The longer you play it, the better it is. And I think that's the best thing that you can say about it, is that, that we're, we have a much deeper, much richer, much funnier, much more successful show than we began a year ago. And this thing of being funny and knowing you're funny, that's something you're born with. You can't be trained how to be funny, can you, really? Well, I don't think I'm funny. I think I'm silly. 
There's a difference. Um, I think uh, I understand my timing, but I also think I'm, I like to make poke fun at myself. And, and I don't mind showing off the little kid inside of me that goes, <laughs> I can't believe I just did that. You know, and, and which makes it endearing. And I, and, and I think that's us. I don't mind being that kind of a person that can do that. Um, it, it, it perhaps kind of uh, it goes against uh, my, my manner as a, as a leading man or, you know, or, or my sense of elegance. But it's uh, the two contrasts, I think, are what make me a silly person. And I like being a silly person rather than I like being a funny person. I'm quite lucky that wherever I go, I'm normally given good seats because they want me to see the best show possible. But what I noticed from my seat was your eyes and the comic timing in the eyes and the subtleties. And it wasn't just me who picked up on that and the eyebrows as well. Nathan Lane was like that as well. Just a blink of the eye or a little raising of the eyebrow, he'd got you. I see you in exactly the same way as him. You're just one of those unique entertainers that is not relying on a previous TV hit, which seems to be the case in most shows these days. Well, that is true. We do, we, we do tend to put anybody that's uh, uh, a reality star in to the next uh, <laughs> long day's journey and tonight we do have a stunt casting that's uh, kind of gone astray but I encourage anybody anybody who has any modicum of success in any medium to come back and try the theater to see really if you have the the, the center and the command to be able to present yourself as a character on stage because the stage will swallow you up uh, if you don't have a, a voice be a, a command um, and, and see an internal constitution that can drive a role in all aspects of the emotional demands. If you don't have all of that stuff, then you, you have no business being on stage. But I encourage everybody to try it and find out what they're made of. It's very interesting you should say that. I saw Beth Midler last Sunday, and she's probably the smallest, diddiest person I've ever met in show business. Tiny. On the biggest stage I think I've ever seen, and she filled it. There are big stars who don't do that, and you've either got it or you ain't, really, is the truth. It actually is. I, I've watched several people on, uh, I won't name names, but several people in, uh, in kind of prefabricated productions on Broadway that were brought in on limited engagements, packed with stars, and they charge high ticket prices, and you go and you're ultimately disappointed because the person has no core to their voice and I don't care how much you mic a person if you don't have a core to your voice you have it would be a little bit like handing somebody a trumpet who's never played one before you think that was absolutely stupid to put them out on stage and say here play the trumpet but no we will send people out on stage with no core to their voice and 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 uh, give them the responsibilities of carrying uh, and creating a character on stage for us well the lunacy applies to me the voice is the core mechanism for an actor and most actors do not know how to use their voice. People say to me, you have a wonderful, you have like a very unique speaking voice, you have a very unique style of speaking, and I say nonsense. I just happen to know how to use my voice so I can do anything I want with it. Now, if you had put me back in the 40s, the 30s, the 50s, any of the time when people learned and they actually studied how to use their voices, I would have been dime a dozen back then. But because now we uh, we tend to drive people through MTV before we bother. Once again, I'm going back on my rant now. Before we uh, bring them to the stage, then I stand out only because nobody's bothered to take the time to study. It took me 10 years in radio to realize that the greatest trick on the radio is to go quiet and use silence. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, silence is a very and, and as it is on stage, as it is on stage, your your, your sense of pauses really are your your ability to command uh, an, an audience. Anybody can run on. Are you being silent? I was just seeing whether it was awkward or not. <laughs> not awkward enough. Very finally, let's talk about your TV stuff and Seinfeld. We don't need to say how massive that is, whether it's in Britain or here. Um, it's still loved. Is there any key to making a great show? It seems like there are less of them. Well, there are because we don't rely on um, uh, great writers anymore. We try to, we, we, unfortunately, in this country, oh, my God, another rant is coming. Uh, we depend so much on reality programming. And what we do when we start to focus on that, we never incubate good writers. Good writers have to learn from other writers, and they have to learn how to release their style that's, that's peculiar to them. And that's only taken, they only get a chance to express that when they have a chance to work on it. And we're not incubating good writers right now. We have all these great writers, and, and, and uh, add on top top of that, that they only want the young writers now. Well, I'll tell you, there are some very funny people in, in Hollywood that happen to be over the age of 50. But no, they want them now. They want them all like tw the kind of edgy 28-year-old um, humor. So consequently, we have one style of humor that you're seeing in the sitcoms right now. And it's, it, it, it doesn't really play out well. 
John, I've read your CV, and the smartest thing I think you have about you and your greatest talent is probably picking the right roles. You don't seem to say yes to anything. You seem to judge whether you think it's going to work. You seem to observe what you're going into and then decide whether to do it. There seems to be an obsession now to say yes to everything. Well, I, I really believe in working from my strength. I know what I like to do, and I know uh, I, I like roles that are commanding roles. I like roles that are elegant roles. I like roles that have a good sense that... Um, have been well thought out and well written because I love to speak with a sense of lyrical quality. I like lines that can go on and that you can play with, words that you can chew. I've been blessed to, be, to have a bunch of those dropped in my lap, and I'm sorry, but I happen to be addicted to those. People can say, you typecast yourself. I'm going to go, well, <laughs> typecast me to my grave. I love coming to places like this to learn stuff and to see new people who impress me. Often I go to the theatre, and I think that was nice, and I think there's no greater insult than nice because it doesn't mean you were moved by it, you were made to feel feel great by it. It was just some way to pass 90 minutes of your life. With this show and others here, you really see people are at the top of their game. That's why they're in Vegas. And seeing you in this show really was inspiring. And thank you very much for spending the time to talk to me, because there must be more important, interesting people for you to talk to. Uh, frankly, I have nowhere else to go. I have nowhere else to go. <laughs> no, I do. No, you know, truly, the one thing I promise is that when people come see the show, they laugh from the moment the conductor's baton drops, and they laugh all the way until the end, and people come backstage, and the, the w most wonderful compliment I've been given is that my jaw hurts from laughing, and I've never had that experience on stage, and that makes me, that's, which is what leads me to say that this is the funniest experience and the silliest experience, to go back to my word that I chose so carefully before, uh, that I've had in my entire career. John O'Hurley, thank you for talking to me. <laughs> nice to talk to you.